Last week we studied about the church and the eternal purpose of God. And as we were singing that song regarding Christ arising from the dead, think for a minute. There would not be the spiritual body of Christ, which is his church, if Christ had not done what he did. If there had been no being tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin on the part of our Lord, if there had been no suffering and death, and in that death, the shedding of his blood, the offering of his body, there would be no church because the church is the spiritual body of Christ. It is to it that he adds all those who have obeyed the gospel of Christ when they were baptized as believers, had <coughs> repented of their sins, into Christ. Acts 2, 38, 41, 42, and 47. So when we think of all of this in the mind of God in eternity, and then we see inspiration recording those things actu uh, actually and accurately, then what a rejoicing it should be that we have in our hands and our possessions for our good, the Bible, and of course, it teaching us about the church. If we were on a ship, and if none of us were Christians, and there were some Bibles on that ship, and the ship sank, and we were able to get to a deserted island, and the Bibles washed up on shore, if we gave our attention to those Bibles and studied them, we would learn how to be Christians, members of the church that's revealed on the pages of the New Testament. Sometimes we act as if, well, that's just almost an impossibility. Yet when you read what is most common to all of us about the profitableness of the Word of God, then we read that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, which means spiritually complete, thoroughly or thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Now that says what I just said about the hypothetical shipwreck, the Bibles, and us on a desert island, and we studied the Bible, and from it we learned what to do to become Christians. Now, we know the church has a great obligation to preach the gospel, and each one of us, wherever we are, to live righteous lives and defend the faith and teach the truth. Yet the Bible is fully capable, in view of the message in it, of teaching us all about how to become a Christian, where Christians are found, and the importance of the church of the living God. So as we studied about the eternal purpose of God last week, let's notice something else in that great revelation pointing us to Christ because in it we'll see it points us also to his spiritual body which is the church in Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 and 3 the great messianic prophet said and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Again, Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. Now that was written, as we've said many times about Isaiah, over 700 years before Jesus walked this earth. But from this prophecy, we learn, first of all, that God's house was to be established in the city of Jerusalem. Let me just stop right there and emphasize this. Any church claiming to be from God that was not established in the city of Jerusalem 
is a church that does not belong to God. Because that's where, according to the scriptures, in prophecy and fulfillment, that the Lord's church was established. Another point is that the Lord's house would be exalted and that all nations would flow unto it. Of course, when you preach the gospel in its fullness, you not only exalt Jesus Christ as our Savior, but you must exalt him for the church that he built. Matthew 16, 18 in Acts chapter 2. And to which he adds every one that has believed in him, repented of his sins, confessed his faith in Christ, and been immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins. Passages I've already noted earlier. Acts 2, 38, Acts 2, 47, and so on. A third point is that the time of fulfillment would be what is called the latter or last days. And so it is that we find in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, the last days, of the Jewish dispensation. Sounds like uh, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now, I realize that according to context, the term last days can mean various things. But since a thousand years is as a day, and a day is a thousand years, Peter says, as far as the Lord's concerned, then uh, if you want to call the last 2,000 years to this point and until the end of time, whenever that is, the last days, in the sense that this is the last days in which God's going to deal with men and offer him salvation, I have no problem with that. But it does have find application in the last days of the Jewish dispensation. Remember, that was the law according to Paul that was a schoolmaster to bring men unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. Paul speaks to Timothy of the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth in 1 Timothy 3.15. He even tells uh, Timothy, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which means the family of God. But what is that family or house? The church of the living God. So the Lord's house is the Lord's church. The Lord's church is the Lord's family. God has his children as the spiritual father in his family, the church. They are begotten by the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. That seed is sown in the minds of men when men are taught the truth, when the gospel is preached to them. And we ought to, we could preach a whole sermon on this, preach about every seed produces after its kind. It's such a simple illustration. Imagine going out and planting Jeff's favorite food, peas. <laughs> what do you expect to come up? Do you expect an oak tree to come up? And if it bears anything, it'll have acorns? That would be ridiculous. So it's amazing how God has taken such an important subject and put it up on such a simple level. So since all seeds produce after their kind, and you sow the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11, and that's done by preaching the gospel, which is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1, 16, then you would expect it to produce the kingdom. But Jesus said in Matthew 16 that the kingdom is the church and the church is the kingdom. And that's also said in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and Colossians 1, verse 18. And lo and behold, in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 4, Paul says there's one body. Well, if the Lord built only one church, upon this rock I will build my C-H-U-R-C-H -H church. And he did it in Acts 2. I know he did it because those that obeyed the gospel were baptized for the remission of sins were by the Lord himself added to that church. He built only one, 
Some people were saying Ephesians 4, well, it says one body there, but that body is something different from the church. It's really a great invisible institution made up of all the various denominations. Well, you can't find that concept in the Bible. It's not there. People have put that in there because they're trying to justify the denominational system, but it's just not there. So if I can understand that he built one church and there's one body and the Holy Spirit defined that one body to be the church, then there's one church that is acceptable to God and has all Christians in it. What bothers me about what I have just preached is not the truth of preached, but the fact that it's not characteristic of churches of Christ all over the land to continually and with steadfastly preach what I've just preached. If we had always done that on every fundamental matter regarding salvation, exposing all those things that are contrary to it, we might have smaller congregations, but they would all be following the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth on the matter. I like what I see sometimes. It says, preach the word. It'll either bring them in or run them out. Do you realize that's exactly what God intended it to do? The Word of God is meant for people who have honest and good hearts, Luke 8, verse 15. In fact, the Word of God, the seed of the kingdom, can only germinate, grow, and produce fruit in such a heart or mind. And if you are going to follow a false doctrine or doctrines, then you're not going to like the truth. And when the truth rebukes you for what you believe and how you act, and you bow your neck against it, now really, who? Who is being hurt by that? Is it the Bible? Is, is it uh, the God of heaven? The only one that's being hurt by it is the one that bows the neck and rejects it. In fact, you have some of that kind of comment made to Saul of Tarsus, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Well, when they would drive animals in those days, especially oxen, they had a pole with a sharp prick on it, and they'd poke him. Sometimes he'd kick back at it, as cows do, and what would happen if he hit it? Well, it just stuck him that much harder. And so it's hard for people to kick against the truth. All it does is expose them that much further. But now if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you want to really make your spiritual skin so tough that the sword of the Spirit can't prick it any longer, just keep rejecting that which you know applies to you. That it's God's Word and you know this is what I ought to do, but you won't do it. There will be a time coming down the road somewhere, if you live long enough, to where that Word won't make one whit of difference to you because you seared your conscience. You stop your conscience from doing what God intended it to do, and that is causing you to realize you're violating and going against the standard God gave for salvation. Now, coming back to Isaiah 2, 2, and 3, and we want to emphasize this, that that wasn't the only place that that kind of comment was made. If you look at Micah 4, 1 and 2, you'll find the same prophecy almost verbatim. Micah was contemporary of Isaiah. But then you come down to Zechariah, and in prophecy, we find him pointing out that the Lord's house, which we've seen to be the church, was to be founded in Jerusalem. Remember I said earlier, if the church uh, you are a member of, or if any church you know of, was not founded in Jerusalem, it cannot be the church of our Lord. List of Zechariah, Zechariah 1 verse 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts. And a line shall be stretched forth over Jerusalem. Well, that's just another place where the Holy Spirit is teaching us that the church was to have its origin in Jerusalem. Let me pause here and insert this. If you could just get people to come back to that fact, let's Accept what the Bible says about the body of the saved being built in Jerusalem and no other place. You will begin to dispel a great amount of error that's found in all sorts and sizes of human churches. In giving the great worldwide commission, 
Jesus even recorded, or Jesus even said, that, the Jeru that Jerusalem was the place that that would begin. In Luke 24, verses 46 through 49, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name, that is, by his authority, unto all the nations. But notice, beginning at or from Jerusalem. Ye are witnesses, speaking to the apostles, of these things. And behold, I send forth the promise of my Father upon you. And now watch. But wait or tarry in the city until you be endued or clothed with power from on high. Again, Luke 24, 46 through 49. Now, Jesus had said to the apostles earlier that there be some which stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom come with power. Now they're told, that's Mark 9, 1. Now they're told to wait here in Jerusalem. What did the prophet said about the church, the house of God being established? That it would begin in Jerusalem. It's also the place, the gospel of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18, verses 5, would first be preached. So we note number one, Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead before repentance and remission of sins could be preached by his authority or in his name. Thus, when you read of the preaching of the apostles on that Pentecost, following the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, you have in preaching salvation in the name of Christ. That's exactly the point made when those who were persuaded by evidence that Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, were pricked in their heart, Acts 2.37, they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he took them as believers and told them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Number two, the proclamation of the message was then to begin in Jerusalem. And we see it when we read Acts 2. And number three, they were to wait in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. Now, Jesus had previously promised the apostles this power, as I pointed out to you. And it's evident from the Apostle John's writing in chapter 14, 26. In fact, let's just not call the verses just all three chapters, chapters 14, 15, and 16, which, by the way, the men who are in the class on Sunday afternoon know we've been studying regarding the work of the Holy Spirit made it clear that the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, would not come until Jesus went away. And that when the Holy Spirit should come, then he would do a number of things. That is, he would teach the apostles all things. He did that through the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. They couldn't have preached what they preached on the day of Pentecost without having first been baptized in the Holy Spirit. They would be able to convict through the preaching of the word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17, the world of sin. Those of you who are Christians, there was a point in your life when you were not. You knew sin was the transgression of the law, and you knew you were a sinner, and you stood condemned before God. And some way or the other, at some point or another, you did what those Pentecostians did. Once you were convicted of your sins and knew Christ was Savior, you said, what must I do? And somebody who knew the Bible or else from your own study of the Bible or a combination of both, you learned the great plan of salvation. And you obeyed that gospel and thus gained remission of sins when you were baptized for them. So you're convicted of sin when you hear the truth that reveals your life and shows you you stand condemned. Well, what do you do? Just say, well, I'm condemned and going to hell? And just say, well, isn't that a wonderful thing? Or do you, as any normal human would, shudder and quake at the very thought of coming before our God, who the writer of Hebrews said is a consuming fire who promises retribution to all those who reject his son. Because in the Great Commission, as Mark records it, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But now notice, 
He that believeth not shall be damned. And he is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Thus it is said of the Romans in reminding them of what they did when they became Christians. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So this is the power from the Holy Spirit that guided and enabled the apostles to be the apostles of Christ. The ambassadors of the court of heaven. The early church knew that. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Acts 2 verse 42. Consider then these passages from the Old Testament. How last week we emphasized that in the mind of God was the church. Not just what Christ would do. But when Christ did what he did, it made possible the church. Why? Because that's where all saved people reside. And the Lord knows the heart of people and knows when they've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. He knows whether they're honest or not. And thus, it's God who forgives sins. We must remember that all sins ultimately are against God. And when we comply with his will from the heart in his mind, he holds our sins and iniquities against us no more. We're clean. Thus we are said to walk, rise and walk in newness of life from the watery grave of baptism. So the Holy Spirit was not to come until Jesus had gone away, John 16, 7. And the record is there saying that the apostles watched him ascend out of their sight, Acts 1 and verse 9. Then we see, as we've read, Luke chapter 24, 49, that the apostles were commanded to tarry in Jerusalem. And this they did. Their faith was not what it would be, but it was to the point to where they did exactly what the Lord told them to do. And there's something interesting in that. Sometimes our faith can't grow till we learn to operate with what we've got where we are. And then we have developed that which allows us to go on further. You see that in the life of faithful Abraham. And the Bible pictures him as the father of the faithful. Abraham had far greater faith at the time he was commanded to offer up his only son, the son whom thou lovest, Isaac, than he did when he left the land of his fathers down there in Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. Yet he had faith enough to obey God then when he commanded him to go out, not knowing whither he went, to the land that he was showing. But he had to grow in his trust and confidence in God based on taking God at his word to the point where his faith could be put to the test and he wouldn't even withhold his own son from a sacrifice to God. And thus he typified God himself offering his son for our sins and making the church possible. Now I hope all of us, since most of us who are here old enough to be that, are indeed rejoicing and thankful that we have that church of which we are members in particular much to be thankful for. The apostles were to be clothed with power from on high, Luke 24, 49. And we read of that in Acts chapter 2. So the Holy Spirit was to come, and we see that he did, in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost Jewish feast day. The word of the Lord was to go forth then from Jerusalem. And that is, was prophesied in Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, because it would be in the latter days. And it echoed by Micah in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. We have the fulfillment of this prophecy again in Acts 2. Many years ago, there was a book written entitled Acts chapter 2, The Hub of the Bible. And you will notice something in proper Bible study that when it comes to the church of the living God, the kingdom of Christ, the body of Christ, the family of God, that everything said about the church before Acts 2 is said in future tense. And everything from Acts 2 on talks about the church in reality. It's there. That church promised by the Lord, Matthew 16 and 18, was built on that day. The blood that was shed on Calvary's cross was applied for the first time to people under that great Christian dispensation. What a thought that is. And yet down through the ages is the history of the world developed. Nations rose and fall. People lived out their lives, many of them completely ignorant of anything about God. 
But God was working constantly to bring all of this about in human history. And so we have it. We as members of the church and knowledgeable as we ought to be, hopefully, recognize we fit into the divine scheme of things. Now, surely that should make us all want to be more determined to live righteous lives and to put God first. Well, what if I were to say, let's have the church of which we've just been studying about, it's revealed on the pages of the New Testament, and in prophecy in the Old Testament, and which we've learned from the Bible last week was purposed in the mind of God before there was time and space and material things. What if we went into community and we can't find anybody there that's a Christian like the Bible defines one to be? Nobody anywhere around. What are we going to do? Well, we have a commission from the Lord. As you're going, preach the gospel to every creature. Do we have that gospel? Yes, we do. We have it in the Word of God. Do we have a Bible? Indeed, we do. Then we would sow the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. Preach the truth. Use every opportunity to teach the truth. I asked Brother I. Rice one time, when he first got to Singapore, and there were no churches of Christ there. And remember, Singapore is not just a city. It's an island republic. It's a city, mostly all makes it up. An island, something like 27, 28 miles long, and I don't know how wide it is, but it's just an island. Basically, all it is is city. But he got there, and there wasn't any church of the Lord. I said, Brother Rice, what did you do? He said, well, we got unpacked. We had our apartment. We got settled into it. And before the first Lord's Day came along, I prepared a sign, put it out on the first, uh, on the, in front of the apartment, and uh, put the number of the apartment. And then I listed that uh, the Church of Christ will be assembling for worship. On well, whatever day it was, uh, on that first day of the week. And that's how we started. And then he said, I began to contact people, get to know people with the full intention of teaching them the gospel. And that's the way it started. And to this day, though he's been dead for a long time now, and the church has undergone all sorts of apostasy and trouble throughout Southeast Asia, when you see a church of Christ anywhere in Malaysia and Singapore, it's because Brother Rice went over there to teach the word or sow the seed of the kingdom. And so it's been with missionaries, as we would call them, anywhere they've gone. Brethren, that's how that a church of the Lord is started in any community on this earth. Therefore, even if this congregation disappeared and all others like it, the Bible's not going to disappear. Jesus has promised us heaven and earth will pass away. My word won't. He even asked one time, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? In other words, the Bible will be here. Will people be believing it and following it? I don't know. All I know is that question was asked by my Lord in his earthly ministry. But I can tell you of a certainty that if the church is started anywhere on this earth, it will be because seed produces after its kind. And the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. And when you teach that word of God to people, the gospel of Christ, as we're commissioned to do, and people believe it and obey it, there the church will be. Really, Christianity is a very simple thing. Just believe and obey the gospel and live like the New Testament said. Worship like the New Testament said. Don't allow anybody to move you away from the pattern of the New Testament. And contend for the faith which we're all delivered to the saints. Now there are many component parts in the truth of the gospel. And you can violate any one of them or several of them. And you're in error when you do. But you can be what the Bible says God expects you to be. We don't serve a God that says I expect you to be this. But I'm telling you right now you can't be. Oh that's not a God that's a monster. But God has done the hard part, if you look at it from mankind's perspective of what's difficult or what's hard. God has loved us even while we were unlovable. Christ came into his own creation that man had polluted and lived the righteous life that a man would live as a man. 
Tempted in every point like as we are. Thus, as the Lamb of God, he could go up on Calvary's cross, suffer, bleed, and die a terrible death. He could be buried, but death couldn't hold him because he was sinless. He would rise from the dead and die no more. Thus, through faith in his name and obedience to his will, we too can enjoy the hard part that's been solved for us. That's all he asked. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. That involves not only belief or confidence in God through Christ by the gospel, but it involves repentance, brethren. You can't just say, well, I'm sorry I did wrong, turn right around and keep on doing it. It means stopping what's wrong and replacing with doing what's right as the Bible defines the right. That's what our lives are all about. That's what we do that makes us Christians or Christians. And we're promised then the Lord will make up the rest. For if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. That's a marvelous thing. And how we treat it so many times is a light matter. We who have benefited, benefited so greatly from it. Now, if you're not a Christian this afternoon, pray tell. What is there that's holding you back from doing what you know the Bible says? Just tell me. What's so important that it's stopping you from obeying your Lord, who's, your Lord who's done so much for you? That, in fact, which you could never do for yourself out of a love that's beyond man's mortal mind to understand. So we urge you to obey the gospel and become a Christian, a member of the Lord's church. As a child of God, have we let these things slip as to the importance, as to the magnificence of the whole thing, as to the privilege we have be able to be Christians. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Servants of the Most High God. If you've sinned, you need to repent of those sins and God's second law of pardon. Confess those sins and we'll pray with you and for you and God will forgive. Let us urge each other on to greater and better things and faithful service to God in the church of the living God, purposed in the mind of God, and is seen by the prophets and revealed in reality on the pages of your own New Testament. Someday, that book will be opened as the standard of judgment for us all. And Christ has said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. So let us use our lives as God intended, learning the truth, and turning from anything that would handicap us from being sure that we're obedient to it, and then to obey it and live righteous lives till life is no more. If you're subject then to the precious invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now.